Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter Jr. and John Russell. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, here is Mario Ritter Jr. Many Americans describe the news media as very biased, but they still believe the work of reporters is important to democracy. That is the finding of a report from the Knight Foundation, a not-for-profit group, and the research company Gallup. Knight and Gallup questioned more than 20,000 American adults between November 8, 2019 and February 16, 2020. That was before the United States began taking steps to fight the novel coronavirus. It was also before protests over the death of George Floyd, a black man at the hands of Minneapolis police. The study's findings, called sobering in the report, suggest that Americans increasingly distrust the news media. John Sands is Director of Learning and Impact at the Knight Foundation. He said that when half of Americans have concerns about the news, it's going to be impossible for our democracy to function. The study confirmed sharp differences of opinion between supporters of the two major parties in the United States. For example, it found that 71% of Republican Party members had a very or somewhat unfavorable opinion of the news media. 52% of independent voters and 22% of Democratic Party members also had unfavorable opinions. However, 54% of Democrats had a favorable opinion of the press. Only 13% of Republicans felt the same way. Sands said this finding is not new and added the differences between the two sides have become deeper over the years. Moving the dial on these attitudes becomes more and more difficult for media organizations, he said. The study did not try to identify reasons for the differences in opinion about the news media. U.S. President Donald Trump often calls stories he does not like fake news. Studies show that more than 90% of media reports on Trump and his administration are negative or appear hostile toward the president. Among those questioned in the study, 48% said the news media has a great deal of responsibility for the country's political divisions. 73% believe that too much bias in news reporting is a major problem. That represents an increase of 8% from two years ago. In addition, Americans did not believe that reporters make honest mistakes. Instead, 54% said 
they believed reporters misrepresented facts, while 28% said reporters made up some of their information. Knight and Gallup found that 41% of Americans have a great deal of trust in the ability of the media to report the news fairly. However, that is down from 55% in a similar study from 1999. A big majority of Americans, 84%, still believe that in general, the news media is either very important or critical to democracy. I'm Mark. TED Talk videos are popular in the United States and other countries. These videos explore issues in science, technology, education, and other subjects. They can also be a useful tool for learning English. Today on Everyday Grammar, we will tell how TED Talks can teach you about some common phrasal verbs, including three with the word hang. They are hang up, hang on, and hang out. We will also explain how you can predict the general meaning of a phrasal verb, even if you do not know its exact definition. But first, let's look a little more closely at phrasal verbs and how they are used. Phrasal verbs are groups of words that have a verb and one or more short words. When combined, the words have an idiomatic meaning. In other words, phrasal verbs have a meaning that is different from what you might expect. Consider the phrasal verb take out. It has the verb take and the word out. Together, they mean to remove someone or something from something else. For example, you can take out some money from your pocket. A phrasal verb can have several meanings. For example, take out can also mean that you get financial help, as in the statement, I want to start a business, but I don't have enough money, so I'm taking out a loan. There are thousands of phrasal verbs. The good news is that you do not need to learn all of them. Your time is better spent learning the most common phrasal verbs. Melody Garnier and Norbert Schmidt are language experts. They made a list of the most common phrasal verbs and their most common meanings. Of the 150 most common phrasal verbs, three involve the verb hang. Hang means to connect or place something so that it is held up without support from below. But as you know now, Phrasal verbs have different meanings than what the verb by itself suggests. The three most common phrasal verbs with hang are hang up, hang on, and hang out. Even if you do not know what each of these phrasal verbs means, you will learn how to predict what they could mean. Let us explore each phrasal verb by listening to TED Talks. You will hear part of a TED Talk and have time to think about what the phrasal verb means. Then you will hear the answer. In our first example, futurist and businessman Juan Enriquez talks about gene editing tools such as CRISPR. While talking about the past, when a long-distance telephone call cost a lot of money, Enriquez uses our first phrasal verb, hang up. Because, of course, you used to get interrupted by operators who tell you long-distance calling, do you want to hang up? And now we think nothing of calling all over the world. Can you tell what Enriquez meant when he said, hang up?
Enriquez gives you an example of the most common meaning of hang up to end or finish a phone call. You can tell that long distance calls must have cost a lot years ago because he said, and now we think nothing of calling all over the world. In our second TED Talk, researcher Max Tegmark talks about the threats and opportunities of artificial intelligence, or AI. Listen to how he uses our second phrasal verb, hang on. We could end up in a fantastic future where everybody's better off. The poor are richer, the rich are richer, everybody's healthy and free to live out their dreams. Now, hang on, do you, do you folks want a future that's politically right or left? Could you tell what Tegmark meant when he used the phrasal verb hang on? In this case, hang on means wait for a short time. Tegmark is asking the crowd to think about what he just said. He makes several statements, then says, hang on then asks a question. You can tell from the sound of his voice that he wants everyone to wait and think. In our third and final TED Talk, we hear from Luis H. Zayas, head of the Steve Hicks School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin. Here he explores how difficult experiences can affect a child's brain. Listen to how he uses hang out. Afterwards, after school, they go home, and they ride bikes, hang out with friends, do homework, and explore the world. All the essentials for child development. Can you tell what Zayas meant when he said hang out? In this case, Hang out means to have fun. Terms like ride bikes and with friends and explore the world suggest that hanging out means having fun. The point of this report was to teach you two things. We talked about the meaning of three common phrasal verbs, but we also talked about how to start thinking about new phrasal verbs. You can use these ideas when you listen to radio broadcasts, watch films, or talk to English speakers. Although phrasal verbs can be difficult, the learning process will be much easier if you spend your time wisely. I'm John Russell. Are you at risk of getting seriously ill from the new coronavirus? Here are some things to keep in mind. 80% of coronavirus cases are mild. Young and healthy people are at low risk. Other people and those with serious health conditions have a greater risk of serious illness or even death. If you have a cough, fever, and difficulty breathing, contact a doctor and stay away from other people. For more information, visit the World Health Organization website at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about William Jefferson Clinton, better known as Bill Clinton. Clinton took office in 1993 and was re-elected in 1996. In many ways, historians consider his time in office a success. The economy expanded and the country was largely at peace. 
But Clinton had some notable failures, too. He could not persuade Congress to accept a plan to reform the nation's health care system. And in his second term, the House of Representatives took steps to remove him from office. But the Senate decided not to act. Clinton finished his second term with high approval ratings. Yet, he is also remembered for being only the second U.S. president to be impeached. Bill Clinton came from a town with a memorable name, Hope. He grew up there and in another nearby town in the southern state of Arkansas. For most of his early life, Bill was raised by his grandmother and his mother, both nurses. His father had died in a car accident before he was born. People who knew Bill as a young man remember him as very intelligent, charming with people, and talented in music. His mother told him he would be president one day. Sure enough, Clinton pursued activities that would lead to a political career. He attended college at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where he studied international affairs, led student government groups, and took a position as a clerk in the U.S. Senate. He went on to study at Oxford University in England on a prestigious Rhodes Scholarship. Then he graduated from law school at Yale University. There, he met another student who would be his wife, Hillary Rodham. The two went on to have one child together, a daughter named Chelsea. After finishing his studies, Clinton returned to his home state of Arkansas and pursued political office. At 32, he became one of the youngest governors ever in the country. Two years later, he was voted out of office and, as historian Russell Riley notes, he became the youngest former governor. And that is how a good deal of Clinton's political career continued in a pattern of successes and failures. His successes often came as a result of his centrist policies, which appealed to people of different political beliefs. He also was an effective public speaker and, to many, a likable, charismatic person who seemed to care deeply about others. But, his critics pointed out, Clinton also appeared to make many decisions simply for political advantage. And he sometimes tried to please so many people that he pleased no one. Following a series of increasingly national roles, as well as a series of setbacks, Clinton campaigned for president in 1992. At first, he did not do well in the campaign. He was young and not well known. He also suffered from reports that he had relationships with women who were not his wife. But in time, Clinton began winning primary contests. Reporters called him the comeback kid. He earned a public image as a politician who could survive problems. In the general election, Clinton competed against the sitting president, Republican George H. W. Bush. The two men also faced an unusually strong third-party candidate named Ross Perot. On election night, Clinton prevailed. Because Americans had split their votes among three major candidates, Clinton earned less than 50 percent of the popular vote. But he won enough electoral votes to become the next U.S. president. 
The people who worked on Bill Clinton's presidential campaign adopted an informal motto. They said, it's the economy, stupid. In other words, campaign officials believed that most Americans cared primarily about how a president's policies would affect their financial concerns. So President Clinton quickly set about making a series of economic changes. They included raising taxes on wealthier Americans and cutting spending to help poorer Americans. In a few years, the U.S. budget deficit was gone, the federal government had a surplus, and the country's financial situation was strong and healthy, although not everyone approved of the steps Clinton took to get there or believed he should get all the credit. Early in his first term, Clinton sought an additional reform he believed would help voters' financial concerns, affordable health insurance for all Americans. Most people in the U.S. either bought private health insurance or did not have any insurance to help pay for medical costs. Clinton wanted to find a way for the U.S. government to support Americans' health-related expenses. He appointed his wife, First Lady Hillary Clinton, to lead a health care reform effort. Hillary Clinton, a lawyer, had led a similar effort to reform education in Arkansas when her husband was governor there. But some lawmakers in Congress, as well as some voters, rejected her efforts. The reform effort failed. Clinton also struggled in some early foreign policy moves. He withdrew American troops from Somalia after their humanitarian efforts there turned into a bloody military struggle. He was also criticized for failing to intervene quickly in the genocide in Rwanda, where hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Later, Clinton won praise for some of his foreign policy. His government helped restore the elected president in Haiti after a coup. It also helped negotiate peace agreements in Bosnia and Ireland. And it cooperated with NATO to intervene in the Kosovo area and stop attacks on Albanians there. In general, Clinton believed the U.S. had an important role to play in maintaining peace and protecting human life around the world. At the same time, he did not want to use too many American resources to do so. He aimed to cooperate with other nations and to set moderate goals. As usual, Clinton adopted an approach that was not too extreme on one side or another. During most of his time as president, Clinton had been under investigation. Federal judges had appointed a special counsel named Kenneth Starr to find out if the president had committed any crimes related to financial investments before he took office. During the investigation, Starr learned that the president had been having a sexual relationship with a young woman who worked in the White House. Starr asked Clinton about the affair under oath. Later, Starr accused Clinton of lying about his relationship with the woman. Starr said that Clinton had also tried to prevent others from telling the truth about some of his activities. In time, the president publicly admitted the relationship, and he apologized to voters and his family. But he said he had not lied or told anyone else to lie for him. Lawmakers in the House of Representatives did not accept Clinton's defense. They advanced two articles of impeachment. Lawmakers in the U.S. Senate then considered the case. It is their job to examine the evidence 
and decide whether to remove a president from office. A majority did not believe the actions Clinton was accused of were serious violations against the country. They voted to acquit Clinton of the charges and permit him to continue as president. In the U.S., a president can serve only two full terms. After his second, Bill Clinton and his wife settled in a town outside New York City. In time, Hillary Clinton became the U.S. Senator from New York, as well as a Secretary of State and the Democratic Party's candidate for president. Bill Clinton, like many other U.S. presidents, wrote about his experiences and helped develop his presidential library. He also worked on humanitarian, health, and economic issues with his family's organization, the Clinton Foundation. For many, Clinton's time in office is remembered as a mixed experience. The economy was at one of its strongest in U.S. history. Most people could find jobs, and many Americans bought homes for the first time. In the mid-1990s especially, the Internet and other new developments created a technology boom. In addition, Clinton was an effective public speaker, and he inspired new groups of people to support his Democratic Party. Many voters approved of his appointments of women and minorities to positions of power in his government. They also liked the steps he took to reduce the use of handguns, protect the environment, and provide paid time off work for some people to care for themselves or their families. But both Democrats and Republicans found fault with some of Clinton's efforts. And even his supporters note that the president had to spend much of his time in office answering charges of wrongdoing. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.